Hello, this presentation is You Buy, How You Bought, When by Richard Halter. With the Chinese virus everywhere, this is my view of its impact on the technology side of retail. What You Are is Where You Were When by Morris Massey. Now, I'm not a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or a sociologist. I'm a geek. I heard Mr. Morris Massey speak many, many years ago. His focus is on how to act, interact between generations based on when you were born. As written about Mr. Massey, Morris Massey presents a framework for understanding and working with all types of people. Morris takes on assumptions about race, religion, age, gender, and helps you develop strategies to deal with your prejudices and accept those of others. For over 30 years, Morris Massey has addressed the issues of values, diversity, generational conflict, and gender with a classic combination of humor and no-nonsense directness. He has helped all of us develop tools for working together. Mr. Massey talks about the various generations. When I first heard him, he was talking a bit about people all the way back to the Depression and its impact on people. When my great aunt passed away, we opened a second floor room and found an enormous amount of things that she couldn't get during the depression. So the impact on her was making sure that if there was another depression, she would be covered. These are the breakdowns that we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at a few of these, not all of them. Baby boomers, basically born between 1944 and 1964. Gen Xers between 1965 and 1979. Gen Y, or Millennials, between 1980 and 1994, and Gen Z, between 1995 and 2015, and finally, Gen Alpha, or the latest group born between 2011 and 2025, and these are the future. So let us look at channel purchase patterns by generation for a few of these generations. Going to stores is preferable for almost every generation except millennials, who like to shop in-store and online equally. For baby boomers, they prefer in-store because they get to actually physically examine the products and the ease of return. Millennials, as I said, prefer shopping online for convenience, and millennials are really addicted to their devices because they, they will be talking to each other even though they may be standing right next to each other. And Gen Z's are moving to an in-store for speed and the social aspects of the purchasing, but they are also heavily addicted to the various online. So let's examine briefly the virus impact on shopping patterns. Virus forced many people to change their shopping pattern from a brick and mortar model to an online model. Because the brick and mortar stores have closed, only the online is available. And I've forced everyone to get comfortable with online shopping. As things open up, I believe many people will keep using online for much of their purchasing. For years, there was this omni-channels model for allowing customers to order basically online and pick up in the store and add other things. But they started expanding omni-channel to include other types of channels like communicating with the vendor directly to have the thing shipped to the store or purchasing on kiosks or mobile phones and finally bringing into, into light the social media and its impact. So now with the advent of things like the Internet of Things, we've expanded the omni-channel model to be more of a unified commerce model. And now direct, without just directly talking to the customer, these, these channels talk with each other about what the customer is looking for. And then we bring in things like robots, robots to go help pick the items off the shelf for the customer. So the customer doesn't even have to go into the store to pick the items themselves. And self-driving cars for delivering those items to the customer. So now we have a fully unified commerce model that takes things from the home all the way through to the delivery. To help understand this and all of its impacts, I've built this interactive virtual unified retail model that has basically got three components. The first component is a business store model, and this is one that shows all of the applications in the retail store and their interconnections with other applications in the store. 
It then includes a whole section on business process modeling so you can deal with the various processes that you must manage in the retail store. And finally, there's this business lifecycle model, which describes how to tie all of these things together to make sure that you stay focused on the proper work that is necessary for your strategy. In control theory, closed loop architectures are inherently stable. That is, they adjust on the fly to changes in the system. This keeps the system in balance and quickly reacts to whatever happens. This is the heart of the interactive virtual unified retail model I've created. This model is based on the knowledge I've gathered from over 1,450 subject matter experts over 20 years. A key component of this model is the connection between the business strategy down to the people, processes, and information, with feedback being driven by the business intelligence. One important component is the value streams identified in the business architecture area. These value streams help focus the business on what it takes to implement the strategy. Now, in the strategy area, there are 11 business strategy groupings. In the business architecture area, there are two components. One is the value stream, and there's 26 value stream groupings. And underneath those, there are capabilities to support the various value streams, and there are over 35 capability map groupings in this. When you move around to the business process area, this is one business process that covers the whole retail business. You move on around to the business organization, and this is basically the org chart that ties the people who need to execute the processes to support the value stream that, that manages the business strategy. And we move on around to the enterprise architecture, and this is where the information is. In this area, there's over nine blueprints, or basically a statement of work for building those various pieces. There are 14 groups of engineering drawings, like life cycle drawings, timing diagrams, etc. There are 29 interface definitions for connecting all of this stuff up, and these are critical when you move on into the microservices architecture we'll talk about in a second. On top of that, there are over 40 physical devices that can be directly connected to this. Using this, this model, you'll be able to swap one device for another, uh, one printer from one manufacturer with a printer from another manufacturer without an enormous amount of effort. And here there's one huge data model with over 8,000 attributes. I would say roughly 80 to 90% of the operational side of the business is covered in this data model. Then to tie it back to, into the business intelligence area we'll talk about in a second, there was one data warehouse with two data marts, and those are all connected to the various KPIs in the business intelligence area. Then there are 20 RFPs to help purchase various applications. So we move around to the business intelligence area, and in there we have 20 KPI groupings that finally link back to the strategy to make sure that we are executing the proper value stream and monitoring it correctly. So you want to move to the IVRM model. How do you move there? Well, I strongly recommend a microservices implementation. Moving this model can be overwhelming. Only a crazy person would try to change their entire organization to support this. Luckily, there's a technique that allows one to migrate this model without seriously impacting the entire system. And this is where the microservices model comes into play. Microservices model moves from traditional monolithic models on the, the big brown box to the service-oriented architecture model, which was popular about 10 years ago. And SOA was pretty good, but it mixed the infrastructure with the application. And microservices came along to solve that problem, and they split the infrastructure components with the application components. And now, now you can build application services that you simply drop into a container that are run now inside of the architecture's infrastructure. The beauty of this is that microservices allow you to change those things that, supply, that provide support for key value streams tied to your business strategy without impacting other areas of your system. So you can, you can migrate to this microservices model piece by piece.
some 20 years ago, the buy online model was seen as um, a niche thing and retailers simply added external systems to support it, but never incorporated those within their bricks and mortar model. Well, the virus has forced a significant change in that, that now the buy online is going to be a much more important model for the future. And being able to switch and move into a fully integrated buy online pickup in, this, in the store unified commerce model is going to require a rethinking of how you support that with the architecture. And therefore, that's where the microservices model comes in but it's got to require you to monitor it closely or you're going to get out of hand with creating an enormous number of microservices rather than those that simply help the business move forward. So I thank you for listening to this. I've written a book called Arts for Retail that you can get out on Amazon or wherever. Uh, I have a YouTube channel that has videos about a number of these things and I'm going to continue to add more videos to this. Uh, I have a blog out there at globalretailtechnologyadvisors.com for you to be able to find written articles about these things. I've also got a couple of uh, courses that you can, you can learn about the microservices ar architecture under the retail architecture course, or I can talk about Pi's log, the lifeblood course. It is one that, that is used to communicate between applications all over retail. So thank you for listening.